I went through that setup twice to try and get it exactly on, but I couldn't figure out how to do slow. It just went fast, and I just had to... <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a slow setting. It's probably the one just to the right. Where are the churches tonight? Okay. Well, the bell did go off, so it's time for us to begin. Um, I'll do the announcements here, and then Michael will, or Mike will have our, our songs. Um, I'll have the devotional. We'll ask Andy to lead the prayer after the devotional and um, let's see there's not too many here just a reminder that in June on Saturday in June 18th we're going to do a pancake breakfast for the guys here at the building and there's a sign up sheet for that function in the entryway and so Coordinate with, uh, I'm sure, Katie and with Jessica on making that happen if you're going to uh, help bring food or cook or whatever's going to happen there. Uh, we've talked about the registrations uh, for camp and so on. Those are in the entryway. Uh, ladies Bible study will be taking off for the summer and restarting again in October. And uh, it says here that the ladies will restart uh, the study of uh, what about the woman or what about the women. Um, as we've all been news is just really dim and awful right now with the uh, Massacre that happened down in Texas, and so we need to we need to keep that those people in our prayers uh, regarding that shooting that happened down there. Um, I understand that Sherry Rainey uh, is recovering. Uh, however, she is still in isolation I guess because I heard that both her daughter and her son who's with the, with her now have both come down with COVID. So that family is uh, having a round robin episode of, of uh, getting sick with the COVID. Uh, if you haven't heard on Monday Helen Ford fell in her home and she has a metal uh, ceramic topped coffee table right in front of her couch there and as she came down she hit her head very very hard on that on that coffee table um, she was taken to the emergency room treated and released and sent home and told to stay in bed for a week. Don't even get up to do dishes or anything like that. So uh, Linda has talked to her. She is doing okay. However, she feels like a Mack truck drove over her and beat her up pretty good. And don't forget to uh, keep those that are listed in our bulletin every Sunday and there's quite a number of them there uh, in, your, in your daily prayers. Does anyone else have any other announcements? Um, you'll notice that the Dales are not here tonight. Uh, as you've heard us talking probably uh, 
both uh, Michael and Jessica have come down sick and are not feeling well. Uh, they're probably burned out and exhausted from all of the intense activity that happened during the gospel meeting and uh, they were quite busy for long periods of time being tour guides and that sort of thing while Michael's dad was up here so uh, touch base with them and say hello and wish them well and so on so I have no other announcements Michael got three songs picked out and then uh, Kurt will have the invitation song after his devotional lesson and the first one is 676 676 if you'd please turn there <clears throat> There's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. My every longing keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me, far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall live with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. And uh, please turn to 377, number 377. Faith, faith, each earthly joy, Jesus is mine. Break every tender tie, Jesus is mine. Dark is the wilderness, earth has no resting place. Jesus alone can bless, Jesus is mine. Tempt not my soul away, Jesus is mine. Here would I ever stay, Jesus is mine. Perishing things of clay, born but for one brief day. Pass from my heart away, Jesus is mine. Farewell mortality, Jesus is mine. Welcome each 
eternity, Jesus is mine. Welcome, O oh loved and blessed, welcome, sweet scenes of rest. Welcome, my Savior's breast, Jesus is mine. And then please turn to number 53. Number five, three. Years that spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiply to me. There my burdens all found liberty at Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything. Now I gladly own him as my king. Now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdens all found liberty at Calvary. salvation's plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man, oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdens all found liberty at Calvary. Kurt. Well, as I've been doing, I'm going to continue with some background about the author of a hymn and speak about the hymn itself. And if you'd like to turn there, tonight we'll be looking at uh, the hymn that's on page 84. Page 84. Bringing in the sheaves. And the text for this was written by a man named, uh, as you can see there uh, on the left, a fellow by the name of Noel's Shaw, uh, back in uh, 1874. And I think I'll, let's talk about the uh, hymn itself uh, before we get into the background about who Knowles was. Um, we're pretty familiar with this hymn, I think. And with that being said, I think we uh, understand that this hymn uh, compares the idea of preaching the gospel and winning souls to bringing in sheaves of grain. So let me ask you who are not 40 and older, what's a sheave? Like 
Bingo, right. And I can remember as a, as a kid, probably Bennett's age or your daughter's age, going to my grandma's farm and they were still cutting wheat with a sickle, gathering it up in bundles and wrapping it in twine and stocking it up, and that was called a sheave. And then they'd come along with the horse-drawn cart and hoist those sheaves up into the, onto the cart and then haul them back, haul them back to, the, uh, to the farmyard. So we, the song is encouraging us to sow the seed in the sense, the same way that the farmers sow seed in the ground. And the whole song is based pretty much on Psalm 126. That's a short psalm, and I'm going to ask somebody to go there and read that for me. Psalm 126, please. Anyone can read that? The, the whole thing. When the Lord brought back the cap captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. And our mouth was filled with laughter, and our tongue filled with singing. And they said among the nations, The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seeds for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. And I do want to emphasize verse 6 there. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtlessly come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Now, I've previously talked about two parables that dealt with seed planting, if you will. Remember, we talked about the parable of the sower that we can read about in Luke 8, and we talked about the parable of the wheat and the tares that we read about in Matthew 13. Um... And we're not going to go there and do that. But there's an emphasis, the focus of those parables is about Jesus teaching and encouraging us to go out and spread the word, to plant the seed. And, uh, of course, uh, in uh, chapter... In, um, Verse 11 of Luke 8, it very plainly states that uh, Jesus says, Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. So with that said and that foundation laid, let's look at stanza one of this hymn. And I'll just read through it. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontide and the dewy eve, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Now I think the emphasis to this verse is the importance that has been laid upon us, the responsibility that's been laid upon us to sow the seed. And that's emphasized in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where we can read in verse 2, where it is written, 
And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others. And remember, this is, uh, this is the instruction, if you will, uh, that I believe it was that the apostles were given to take the word that they had been taught, to take the word that they had been given, and to go and teach others that word and, and spread uh, that word around and about. Now, when we look at stanza two, and again, I'll read through this. Sowing in the sunshine. So we've moved from the morning to the middle of the day. Sowing in the sunshine. Sowing in the shadows. Fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. As I was studying this, and preparing for this, I thought how well the theme of this song fits in with the evangelism that we are trying to do in this congregation and how this is an encouragement for us to go forth and evangelize and how important it is for us to do that. And we're actually instructed specifically to do that in uh, Mark chapter 16 where in verse 15 we can read and he said to them go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature so we we have to have that attitude as we evangelize as we share the gospel we have to understand that this is something that we need to do. It's not a suggestion. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a commandment. I also hooked uh, John 9, John chapter 9, with this verse. Uh, right there at the beginning of the chapter in verses 4 and 5 where we can read, I must work the works of him who sent to me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. We had a number of years ago uh, incident that happened in our doorway as we entered the building when one of our elders suffered a heart attack and his life came to an end just like that. We have no guarantee that we will be here tomorrow or for that matter at 10 o'clock tonight. And so the encouragement here is to work while it is day. Work while you have the opportunity because you don't know when night is going to come. You don't know when you're not going to be able to work and plant that seed. I think that's pretty important we just don't know what our next breath uh, might come to an end. Now in stanza three, this is a, and I'll address this later, 
In stanza three, it, it, when you just read it on its face, it seems a little bit confusing. Go then even weeping, sowing for the master. Though the law sustained our spirits often grieves, when our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. I think there's a much deeper study that could be done of even weeping or go weeping or go sowing while you weep. I'm not sure that I fully understand that. Uh, there is passage within scripture that talks about that. Um, and I'm sure there's a broader context to that. But as it shows up in this hymn, um, I learned something about Knowles Shaw and his circumstance that may have had a bearing on this third verse and why it is worded the way it is. So the harvest is going to come. We know that. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, is along the same lines of another parable that we've studied before about uh, as Christians, we need to run the race and we don't need to just participate. We actually need to run the race to win the race. In Colossians, in verse 23, it starts out, and whatever you do, do it heartily. In other words, you really need to be committed to doing whatever it is you're going to do. You need to put your whole self into it. And whatever you do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not to men. Speaking for myself, a lot of times I get discouraged because the reactions that I get or the feedback I get from people sometimes is negative. I got to remember that in planting the seed and spreading the word and trying to let Christ's light shine through me, I'm doing it for the Lord. I'm not doing it to impress other men. Verse 4, or 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And then together with this third verse, there's a much longer passage that I think applies here as well. Um, and it goes to what I, I will comment again later on, but how many times, and particularly that some of us felt, at least I did, when we did door knocking for the gospel meeting, uh, I think Michael said that we had 800 or 1,000 doors that we stopped at. We didn't have any visitors from the neighborhood that attended the gospel meeting. Now that's pretty discouraging. And you could let that get you down and get you discouraged. But in 1 Corinthians in chapter 3, and we've read this, we've studied this before, beginning in verse 6. I planted... Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, 
I think the, the lesson here is that we may not see immediate results. We may be actually building on a foundation that somebody else has already laid and we're building on top of that and we may or may not see a result from that because somebody else will come along and build on top of that yet again and water it if you will but at some point God will give the increase so then neither he who plants is anything nor he who waters but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. There it is. I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. For no other foundation can, be, uh, can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold or silver or precious stones or wood or hay or straw, each one's work will become clear, will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work. Remember how we have examples in the Bible how uh, fire refines metals and gets rid of the dross well that, I think that's part of what's uh, included in, in the lesson here that that if you don't lay gold or, 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 or the seed down on top of that foundation fire will come along and the dross will be burned away If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. So the conclusion then, in looking at the verses and the text of this hymn, the conclusion is that this song is an encouragement for us, a reminder to us, that we need to be sowing the seed. Um, one way to look at it is that we really don't have a choice. It's not a suggestion, as I said before, it is a command that we have been given to go sow the seed that we might reap our reward in heaven. Now let's... Uh, Let's talk about the hymn's author here, uh, Knowles Shaw. Uh, this gentleman was born in Ohio in the fall, in October, in 1834. He was a son of Scottish descent. Now, church children, uh, Knowles Shaw, his father died when he was only 10 years old. Can you imagine if your dad suddenly was no longer part of your family, how difficult that might be to grow up and mature? Well, that's what happened to Knowles. At about 10 years of age, his dad died and he struggled to grow up in a fatherless house. Just before passing away, his father advised him to prepare to meet thy God. And 
I suppose at the same time, the biographies and stuff, the information I read about uh, Knowles didn't really say when this happened, but his dad gave him a violin and he learned to play that violin on his own and he became a very good musician because of that, very proficient. Um, there's a huge plethora of information about uh, on the internet about Knowles, and I'm just going to hit some highlights here. All of the following happened while he was still a teenager. Uh, he was known to learn things very, very quick. And anything that he put his hand to do, he accomplished. He learned how to repair shoes, fix watches, sewing machines. He became a carpenter and was a store clerk. And as I indicated earlier, he became a professional musician. He gathered together some other people around him and he established his own band. And this band then began playing for parties and for dances and things like that. And during his teenage years, and especially during this, uh, this time when he was playing at dances and parties and that sort of thing, he became, although it doesn't say it, I suppose that he became an alcoholic. He became an abuser of alcohol. And in the biography that I'm uh, getting a lot of my information from, uh, it says that at about 18 years of age, during one of these performances that his band was doing, he recalled his father's words to prepare to meet his Lord. And he started to become, right then, during that, that party, if you will, uh, he, he started to get depressed. Uh, he started to get disillusioned about his life. And uh, shortly after that, he began attending the Flat Rock Christian Church in Rushville, Indiana. And in the fall, September of 1852, he was baptized at the age of 18. So I've read in places that during this teenage years, he was living quite a life of debauchery, carrying on and just apparently was a party animal. Marrying in 1855, five children were born into the family. And between 1865 and 1869, Two of those children died in infancy almost within the same year. And within just a couple of years of that, a 14-year-old daughter died of a serious injury. So within about uh, a four-year period of time, three of his children passed away. He began preaching and evangelizing in his early 20s. Uh, this occurred as he traveled throughout uh, Indiana, Ohio, Illinois, and the Mississippi areas, uh, holding tent meetings. He worked tireless, tirelessly in gospel meetings and was known to preach, and I thought this was interesting, uh, I was hoping that Michael would be here tonight because um, he's a bit worn out, I think, and I was going to emphasize the fact that Knowles was preaching uh, at least twice a day during his 
gospel meetings and tent meetings, and three times on Sunday. And he was known that uh, during the day when he wasn't with brethren, he was out in the business community, knocking on doors, going into the businesses, introducing himself, and inviting people to attend the meetings. And he became known as a singing evangelist. And he was killed in a train accident in the summer of 1878 while traveling to uh, McKinney in Texas, which is just north of Dallas. Now, let's, let's tie this all together. Bringing in the Sheaves was written in 1874. Uh, and the biography information says that it was dedicated in memory to a fellow preacher and songwriter who died in 1870. So now we have a fellow who had uh, somebody that he admired, a fellow preacher and songwriter that he knew well, who died in 1870. He had three of his children pass away within the four years just prior to that. So the man is going through a lot of grief in his life. And as we've spoken about before, a lot of our songs are the result of people suffering and struggling through tragedy in their lives, yet rising above it with the strength that Christ gives them. And I'm thinking that with that background, this is why the wording is as it is in the third verse of this song. This song, by the way, uh, has been part of a number of different movies and television episodes. And those of us who can remember Little House on the Prairie or are watching the reruns, uh, this song was sung almost every time that the Ingalls family went to church. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, the song's use of planting seeds is similar to a farmer's efforts to plant seeds in the expectation of a future harvest. Both must be done with faith that an increase will occur. Uh, the lower 48 in a lot of places is suffering severe drought. Can you imagine how stressful and difficult it is for the farmers to go out in the springtime in conditions that are really bad and, and plant seeds in faith expecting that over time with watering and nurturing, there will be a harvest. In the same sense, we as Christians need to have faith that our efforts at evangelism and seed planting will have results and produce fruit. We sing another song that says, let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. That's another encouragement to keep on keeping on, if you will. Don't grow weary. So we are encouraged not to become, as I said earlier, discouraged when our efforts to sow the seed doesn't show immediate results. It takes faith and trust in God to have the endurance to reach the harvest. So let's uh, pick up our song books and let's sing this hymn. Do you all have it? <clears throat> Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the new tide and the dewy eve. 
waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Sowing in the sunshine, sowing seeds and stones, fearing neither clouds nor winter's chilling breeze. By and by the harvest and the labor's ended, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Go then even weeping, sowing for the master. Through the loss sustained, our spirits often grieve. When the time is over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. And the invitation song that I've picked out is 727. 727. And let's stand as we sing. Though the way we try, no. Though the way we journey may be often dear, we shall see the King someday. On that blessed morning, clouds will disappear. We shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. Gathered of the throne, we shall call his we shall see the king someday too. After pain and anguish, after toil and care, we shall see the king someday. Though the endless ages, joy and blessed dream, we shall see the king someday. We shall see the King someday. We shall shout and sing someday. Gathered round the throne, we shall call his own. We shall see the King someday. There with all the loved ones, have gone before. We shall see the King someday. Sorrow pass forever on that peaceful shore. We shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We shall sing the King Someday, gathered round the throne, 
we shall call his own. We shall see the King someday. Andy? Please be seated now. I went a lot longer than I thought on this Devo, and so there's only about 10 minutes left. Uh, we can do a song and be done, or we can be done right now. We can visit and fellowship. Okay, we are done. Thank you for your attention. I, I hope this is beneficial. And I hope there has been encouragement in learning a little uh, more about the songs that we sing. <laughs>